This is the seventh video in the Edexcel B3 revision tutorial series. In this video we will be looking at conditioning and behaviour. This is the first video which will look at the elements of behaviour that you need to know for B3. The second half where we'll be looking at communication and more behaviour in detail we will be doing in B3.8. In this video, we will look at what innate and learned behaviour mean. We will look at how animals can be trained using both classical and operant conditioning. We will look at the behavioural studies of two ethologists. These are Nicholas Timbergen and Conrad Lorenz. And finally, we will look at how choice chambers can be used to investigate animal behaviour. So what is behaviour? Well, behaviour is how an animal or an organism responds to stimuli from its surroundings, or how it responds to things that are going on in its environment. These are usually done in order to help the organism survive. Behaviour can either be inherited or learnt, but most behaviour relies on a combination of these two. This means that your behaviour is influenced by both your genes as well as your environment. You need to know examples for both inherited behaviour as well as learnt behaviour. There are some examples of behaviour that are a combination of these two. Inherited behaviour is known as innate behaviour. This is a type of behaviour where you respond in the right way to a stimulus straight away, even if you have not done this previously. For example, a baby feeding from a bottle. We also have innate behaviour such as reflex actions. So you will have looked at reflex actions in Edexcel B1. These include reflex arcs, such as moving your hand away from a hot flame as well as more simple responses, including sneezing, salivation and blinking. Some forms of innate behaviour are slightly more complicated. For example, earthworms will naturally move away from light. This is known as negative phototaxis. Also, sea anemones can pick up the chemicals emitted by their prey, which will cause their tentacles to move towards the prey. This is an innate behaviour, they have not had to learn this. You also need to learn an example of learned behaviour. So learned behaviour is where an animal learns from a previous experience and changes its behaviour accordingly. Having a lot of learned behaviour can lead to habituation. This is where the animal learns not to respond to something. So, for example, why we might see crows sitting on a scarecrow. Initially, the crow will be scared of the scarecrow, as it will associate it with danger. Over time, the crow gets used to the stimulus and learns that the scarecrow is not harmful. This means that the bird will ignore the scarecrow and, in fact, may well decide to sit on it. This is especially useful in young animals as they learn that certain noises are not threatening to them. An example of this would be wolves living near an airport. So naturally in the wild, wolves are very, very scared of loud noises. Loud noises equal danger. However, if wolves live near an airport, over time they will get used to the noise of the planes and will no longer associate the noise of the plane with danger. This is important as animals will learn to ignore non-threatening and non-rewarding stimuli so then they can spend their time and energy more efficiently and only react to stimuli which will still possibly be dangerous to them. Some types of behaviour are a mixture of both innate and learnt. One example of this is imprinting. So imprinting is when an animal recognises its parents and instinctively follows them around. So we've got the innate behaviour of following the parent as well as the learnt behaviour by following the parent and following what they do. This behaviour is especially prominent in birds where they will have an instinct to follow the first moving object it sees. This should be its parent. The animal has no innate instinct of what its parents look like, so they have to learn this. 
This type of behaviour has been studied extensively, so ducklings will usually imprint on their parents. But if ducklings are raised by hand, so by humans, then the human is the first moving object they see, and so the ducklings will follow the human instead of their parents. In this regard, habituation is a way of training, of the animal learning what to do. However, we can also train them using two types of conditioning. The first type of conditioning you need to know about is classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is most known for the work by Ivan Pavlov, who looked at dogs. Classical conditioning happens when an animal learns passively to associate a neutral stimulus with an important one. The main study you need to know of this is the one carried out by Pavlov on dogs. Pavlov observed that dogs would salivate every time they saw or smelt food, so every time he presented them with steak, the dog would produce saliva. He then began to ring a bell when he was presenting the food. This meant that the dogs started to associate the neutral stimulus, which was the bell, with the important stimulus, which is the steak. He then removed the steak and simply rang the bell and the dogs would salivate. This is because the dogs associate the noise of the bell, that neutral stimulus, with the presentation of food, which is the important stimulus, which is the one they want to receive. The second form of conditioning you need to know about is operant conditioning, which is often attributed to Berha Skinner here with the Skinner's box. So operant conditioning is when an animal learns a behaviour by trial and error. So it learns that some behaviours give a reward, whereas others don't. This means that the animal is learning actively to associate an action with a reward or a punishment. This is common in humans where children are rewarded or punished for specific behaviour. An example that you need to know for operant conditioning is the use of the Skinner box. So Skinner trained rats and pigeons to obtain a food reward using a small cage, which is here, which is the Skinner box. The animal has a choice of buttons, one which rewards them with food. The animals then learn, via a system of trial and error, how to get the reward each time. In conclusion, this means that classical conditioning is where an animal learns passively and the response is automatic and reinforced by repetition. Whereas in operant conditioning, the animal is learning via trial and error, and so it is learning actively to associate an action with a reward or a punishment. We can use both classical and operant conditioning in order to train animals to do certain things. Most training of animals nowadays happens via operant conditioning. This is where we give rewards when the animal does what we want, or punishment when it does what we don't want it to do. Treats can include things like food or praise, whereas punishments again can be vocal or can be more physical, like choke chains. Nowadays, punishment isn't recommended for animal training as it stresses the animal out and rewards work just as well, if not better. Some examples can be seen here. First of all, we have our police horse here, which has been trained to only respond to commands from their riders, as well as being habituated in order to ensure they do not panic when they are surrounded by a large group or there is a large amount of noise going on around them. So it's overcoming that innate response to panic and bolt and allowing them to get used to this new environment. Our second example here is our sniffer dog. So sniffer dogs have been trained to find drugs in suitcases. This is done operantly as the dogs are rewarded when they find the drugs during training and so they start to associate finding the drugs with getting the reward. And finally we have guide dogs who are trained to stop at a roadside and wait for a command. So again they've been operantly trained in order to display the correct behaviour that will enable them to support the blind or deaf person. Some animals are still trained using classical conditioning or a combination of both classical and operant conditioning. 
An example of this combination is in the training of dolphins. So we can use a combination of classical as well as operant, as a treat cannot always be given when the act is completed. For example, a dolphin can't be rewarded with fish at the exact moment it does a jump. So the dolphin will associate the sound of the trainer's whistle with the fact that they will get the fish. So in many ways, the whistle is in fact the reward as it tells the dolphin that it will get the fish at the end. So if the dolphin is learning via trial and error in order to get the reward, however, you've also got the classical conditioning happening with the whistle. Training animals in this way is a point of controversy at the moment due to the film Blackfish. Blackfish focus both on the captivity as well as the training of an orca at a SeaWorld park in San Diego. The orca would have been trained using both classical and operant conditioning. In the exam, a popular examination question looks at how you would train a dog. You need to talk about both operant and classical conditioning. For Edexcel B3, you need to know about four different animal behaviour studies. We're going to look at the first two in this tutorial and then the second two in the next tutorial. This is because the two that we're going to focus on look at both innate behaviour as well as imprinting, whereas the ones we will look at in the next tutorial video are going to look at social behaviour. People who study animal behaviour are known as ethologists. The first one you need to know is Nicholas Timbergen. Nicholas Timbergen studied innate behaviour in herring gulls. He noticed that newly hatched gull chicks knew how to peck at their parent's beak in order to request food. He also noticed that adult gulls have this signature red spot on the bottom of their beak. He wanted to find out if this red beak had anything to do with the fact that chicks would want to peck the beak in order to get food. In order to do this, he showed newly hatched gull chicks cardboard gull heads with different colour spots on the beaks, and he counted the number of times that the chicks pecked the different spots in a given time frame. He found out that the chicks pecked at the beaks with these red spots much more often. This led Timbergen to conclude that the chicks are born with an instinct to peck at the red spot, as this will help them to find food. So this pecking at the red spot on the beak is an innate behaviour. The second ethologist you need to know is Conrad Lorenz. Conrad Lorenz looked at imprinting in geese. Imprinting, as we looked at earlier in the video, is when a bird is born and it will naturally recognise its mother and then learn to follow her around. What Lorenz did is he took two groups of goose eggs, one which he labelled group one and one which he labelled group two. Group one were hatched out by their own mother, while group two were hatched in an incubator. The first moving object that the geese chicks in group one saw was their mother, so they followed their mother around. For the goose chicks in group two, the first thing they saw was Lorenz himself. The geese chicks from group one followed their mother around, whereas as we can see in this picture here, the geese chicks in group two followed Lorenz around. The geese chicks had formed an attachment to the first moving object they saw, and this is known as imprinting. It helps the geese chicks to recognise their mother, but obviously for the geese chicks in group two, the first living object they saw was Conrad Lorenz, so they treated him as their mother. We can also investigate animal behaviour by using choice chambers. A choice chamber is a container that's divided up into two or more chambers. This enables us to set up different environments inside each chamber so we can have a dark section or a wet section. We then can put some animals inside the container, for example insects, more often than not things like wood lice, and observe which chamber they move to. Most of them will head to the section with the environmental conditions that are closest to their natural habitat. An example of a choice chamber can be seen here. So we can see that half of it is kept dry, the other half is wet. One half of it is dark and the other half is dry. 
By using a choice chamber, we can look at how different animals respond to changing environmental conditions. So we can look at light intensity, so we can compare light and dark, as well as having a look at humidity. So here we've got dry and here we've got damp. So we can make these in the lab using a Petri dish and cardboard. So we can divide up our Petri dish in order to form these different environments. We then put a lid on the top of the Petri dish, making sure we have left a space in the middle so that the animals can move, as well as ensuring we have holes in the lid in order to make sure the animals can breathe and respire. We do, however, need to make sure that these holes in the lid aren't too big, as this will allow the insects to escape. As I previously mentioned, we can do this in the lab with wood lice. So we'd have four sections, A, B, C, and D, and we can cover two of these with black paper, meaning that they will be dark. We can then put some damp paper at the bottom of two of them as well, as well as maybe adding some calcium chloride in order to make sure that this is kept dry. We can also use cotton wool in order to keep this damp. We then put some wood lice in the centre and leave it for 10 minutes. We can then record how many wood lice are in each section, enabling us to form a conclusion about the behaviour of the wood lice. So what are the environmental conditions that wood lice prefer? It's important to make sure we control any other conditions to keep the test fair. For example, making sure the chambers are the same size and that the test is done at the same temperature. We then repeat the experiment a few times with different wood lice in order to get a reliable result. This concludes this tutorial video. Within this video, we have looked at innate and learned behaviour. We have looked at both classical and operant conditioning, as well as looking at some animal behaviour studies, as well as a way of investigating animal behaviour. In the next video, which will be B3.8, we'll be looking at social behaviour and communication, mating behaviour, as well as parenting behaviour. We will also look at our two remaining ethologists.